If you're watching this video, then you probably already know some of the benefits of training your neck. Other than how it can completely transform your appearance from the chest up, a thicker, stronger neck can protect us from sudden jerking motions such as in a fight, or from extreme deceleration such as in a car crash. And it's because of this protective effect that F1 drivers, fighter pilots, wrestlers and even boxers all do some sort of neck training. But you may be thinking, is this actually safe or am I gradually going to destroy my spine and end up regretting it later down the line? Well, let's find out. What are you saying guys? Welcome back to another video. My name is Isa and I'm a medical student with a passion for fitness. So, are neck cards safe? Well, the short answer is yes, but you have to make sure that you're doing them correctly. And for that to happen, let's first look at how the muscles work and the movements that are actually involved. There are two deep muscles which are quite weak neck flexors called the longus capitis and the longus cervicis. And then we have the main muscle that contributes to neck flexion called the sternocleidomastoid or SEM. And you may have heard of this before. It originates from the collarbone here, the clavicle, and here, the breastbone or the sternum. And then it inserts behind the ear on the bony part called the mastoid process. And that's why it's called sternocleidomastoid. Now the SCM muscle has quite a few different functions. So if you were to contract just on one side, it causes rotation of the head. So if you contract your left SCM, you turn your head to the right. So we call it contralateral rotation. And another major function is obviously neck flexion, which is the motion that we're trying to target in this exercise. And to do that, what you want to avoid is doing any neck bridging. So this involves the standard front bridge when your face is facing the floor, um, also the back bridge where your face is facing the ceiling, and even more advanced exercises like the headstand bridge. Now don't get me wrong, these exercises build strong, massive, powerful neck muscles. And that's why you see a lot of wrestlers especially, but also boxers and MMA fighters doing these bridges. Um, and I never thought that I'd be saying to avoid these exercises because for those of you that don't know, um, I used to do a lot of freestyle wrestling back when I was in school for about four or five years. And every training session we used to do these neck bridges, different variations, but all the time training our necks in this way. So if my wrestling coach is watching, he won't be too happy about this. Um, but the main thing is that although it builds these powerful necks, we need to be aware of what sh what's happening beneath the muscles and happening to the, the bones and ligaments underneath. Because you see the bones in our neck called the cervical vertebrae are designed to do many different types of movement. Um, lateral flexion, rotation, flexion, extension. But the one movement that they're not designed to do is compression. And the bridging exercise puts a lot of emphasis on those vertebrae and those discs in between. And this is bad because it can do two things. So first of all, all that pressure will be squeezing the intervertebral discs between the actual vertebrae. And over time, this can cause a slip disc where it presses on the spinal cord and causes spinal cord compression. The other thing that it does is it can cause inflammation as the bone is damaged over time. This forms little bony projections called osteophytes. And these are gonna dig into the spinal nerves that come out from either side of your vertebrae and so it can cause tingling sensation, numbness, weakness, and it's just something that you don't want to happen down the line. And when these small osteophytes block the spinal nerves, it's called reticulopathy. And there was even a study that showed that wrestlers are 20 times more likely to get something called cervical spondylolysis, which is when um, inflammation happens in the spine due to wear and tear over time. And this was in the 40s and 50s that they saw a lot of wrestlers getting it and this was compared to people that never wrestled and it may be attributed to the practice of doing a lot of bridging in almost every training day. And that brings us on to the weight and neck curl. Why is it safe exactly? Well, first of all, it's a natural plane of motion, it's flexion, there's no compression that's involved. Uh, secondly, if your neck does get tired, because of the way that we hold the weight over our neck, you can always move it with your arms so that you can bail out if your neck gets too tired. And also, I'll leave a link in the description showing that Greg Knuckles has also confirmed that this exercise isn't really damaging to the spine. So let's look at how to actually perform the neck curl safely and effectively. Well, first what we want to do is warm up. 
and first we need to mobilize the muscles and joints and to do this as I'm showing now you can just do some flexions and extensions some rotations of the head lateral flexion and just make some circular motions with your head and this is just to ensure that the joints are mobile and lubricated and the muscles are getting warmed up the SCM but also the muscles surrounding it and this is going to help us prevent any muscle strain and I've seen a lot of youtubers refer to this strain of the neck as zinger but these zingers also called stingers or burners are something else and that's when the neck is forcefully pushed to the side or downwards for example and you get a electric shock rushing down the arm from the neck or like a stinging sensation and then it goes after like a few seconds or a minute maybe um, and this is just something that I wanted to clear up um, pain after doing um, neck curls is more likely to be muscle strain than a zinger as zingers don't really last that long so to set ourselves up for the neck curl what we want to do is first bring our chin backwards and this is going to create a nice base for the movement similar to when you pull your shoulders back for the bench press this is going to do the same thing and make sure that you're focusing on that SEM muscle. It's also a good idea to keep your jaw shut so that your teeth are touching one another and this helps prevent any clicking when you're doing the curl. And if we're trying to play it safe then we can also limit the range of motion in the neck curl so cutting out the extreme ends so this means that we won't be going too far back where we're hyperextending the neck and also not excessively flexing the neck and bringing it forward too much. And when you're doing the exercise you really want to feel the front muscles of your neck contracting. You don't want to be using any momentum, you don't want to be using too much arm swing. Um, some people even turn this exercise into a crunch. Uh, you don't want your abs to be involved that much. It should be a small range of motion where you can feel the front flexors of the neck working throughout and you shouldn't be controlling the weight. This doesn't mean that you have to do it very slowly as long as you are controlling it on the way down and not letting the weight just drop down on its own. And just a couple of tips, so firstly the weight plate, the center of it should rest on your forehead. This makes sure that the neck is actually moving the weight and it makes it less likely that your arms are going to be pulling it and you're going to feel it more this way. Secondly, you might want to try using a rubber plate because it can actually hurt your forehead after a while. Um, alternatively, you can use a, a beanie, just throw on a beanie and make sure it covers kind of the eyebrow area of the forehead and then just slap on the weights and do your neck curls like that. And in terms of sets and reps, because it is a small range of motion, we want to make up for that by doing a high volume set. So this would be similar to the calves or the forearm muscles. Because the range of motion is small, uh, we want to make up for that by using the time under tension to really grow the muscle. And so you can do four sets of 25 for example and take it up from there or increase the weight and drop the sets down a bit. And just like any other exercise, if you start using a weight that's too heavy too soon, you're more likely to get muscle strain or injury and something that we don't want to happen. So to avoid this, if you are a beginner, just start with body weight, just your neck moving alone. Um, then you can gradually work your way up to a small plate, maybe 5 kg, and then over time gradually build up the weight, just as you would with any other exercise. And finally, it's important to remember that this exercise only trains the front flexors of the neck. So it's important that we train the other muscles of the neck as well, so neck extension and lateral flexion especially, as this is what's going to help avoid any imbalances and any postural problems down the line. And I'll be making some videos soon about how to do these exercises that I just spoke about. And that wraps up the video for today guys. If you found it interesting or helpful, please click on the like button down below. If you are new to the channel and you want to see more videos backed by science, then make sure you click on the subscribe button and the notification bell so that you stay up to date. But with that being said guys, work hard but work smart and I'll see you in the next video.